Hello, how's it going? Um, I don't think I've ever been in a room with so many vegans. This is really <laughs> exciting. Um, these sorts of events are really exciting to see people coming together and acting as one movement. And today wouldn't be possible without Judy and Damien and all of the work they've put into organising this. So can we start with just giving them a huge round of applause for making this possible? So no matter who you are or where you're from, it's a scary time to be growing up in the world today. All you have to do is read the news. At the start of this year, I made the mistake of subscribing to every environmental newsletter I could. The New York Times is climate forward, uh, the Guardian's green light, Greenpeace is unearthed, even Yale University's Environment 360. And every morning, the view of the world through my inbox is terrifying. The ice caps are melting, the sea level's rising, the coral reef's bleaching, there's an increase in drought, floods, wildfires, hurricanes and storms. We've emptied our oceans of fish and replaced them with plastic. We're fast destroying our few remaining fragile ecosystems. We're in the midst of the sixth greatest extinction. This is the reality. This is my future, our future, and it's bleak. By now, most of us know the narrative. Through burning fossil fuels and rearing billions of cows, us humans have created an excess of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, and these greenhouse gases are trapping hot air, causing the Earth's temperature to rise, and we're only just beginning to understand the consequences. For the whole of modern human history, we've existed in this period known as the Holocene, which is a relatively stable period of climate that has allowed us to thrive, farm, settle, and build civilizations. Our planet is stable precisely because of the connections that link its oceans, forests, rivers, and grasslands. Yet in the space of just one human lifetime, we've disrupted these connections so much that for the first time in 12,000 years, we're living on an unstable planet. Scientists are now saying that we've entered this new geological epoch known as the Anthropocene, the era of human-caused permanent planetary change. Growing up, my mother talked to me about climate change and the environmental issues we face. She ran this local group called Climate Action Now, and I vividly remember her taking us to protests as young children. I'm happy to say that that mop of hair next to her is in fact my twin brother, and not me. <laughs> Although it's one of the advantages of being twins, if you don't like the picture, you can just blame it on the other. <laughs> and so I remember at the time being inspired by my mother, who's here tonight, and she would go out, um, there you go, round of applause for my mother. I was inspired to see my mum standing up for what she believed in. But at the time, I didn't really understand what it was all for. It was hard to understand because looking out the window, when I looked out the window at my environment, I couldn't see a problem. It looked fine. And looking back, that wasn't just childish naivety, but in fact, the very crux of the problem. How can we take action against a catastrophe that we can't see? How does this climate change affect me and my life? So in 2014, I'd been making short films on YouTube and I was approached by the World Wildlife Fund. They offered me a chance to join a science research trip to Greenland to make a short film about glacial retreat. Now at the time, I knew little about what was happening in our polar regions, but it seemed like an amazing opportunity to travel to this remote part of the world. And so myself, my brother, this time sensibly wearing a hat, uh, our cinematographer called Tim, a glaciologist known as Alan Hubbard, and a polar expert known as Rod Downey, travelled to Kangalusak in southern Greenland. And while we were there, we had one of the most unique experiences I've had to this date. We were dropped by helicopter on the Yak of Southern Glacier, which is one of the fastest retreating in the world. And we were there to retrieve data from the Extreme Ice Survey, which is essentially a group of cameras taking pictures of the glacier to monitor its change over a period of time. And so we were left there with a tent and a couple of sleeping bags, and we set up the tent on the edge of the glacier overlooking the ice sheet. And that night, um, it was minus 10 degrees. And I didn't sleep a wink, despite wearing a hat, a coat, two jumpers, two pairs of trousers, two pairs of socks. I didn't sleep because I was kept awake by the sound of these large pieces of ice carving off the front of the glacier. When we woke the next morning and we retrieved the data from the cameras, you could physically see pieces of ice carving off the front of the glacier and crashing into the ocean beneath. Indeed, just a month before it arrived, a piece the size of Manhattan had broken off in just one day. Now, what happens when this ice falls off and crashes into the ocean is it melts and it contributes to global sea level rise. 
And then what happens is that the white ice is replaced with dark water, and so the heat is absorbed and not reflected, and therefore the water temperature increases, more ice melts, and this vicious cycle occurs. It's what scientists are calling runaway climate change. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm no scientist, and my high school teachers will attest to that. I had that teenager version to it that I think many people can relate to. And I think it's for this reason that up until this point, I'd avoided all news about climate change. It seemed intimidating and overwhelming, complicated graphs and numbers about things that were happening in faraway places. But that night on the glacier, it turned my world upside down. There was nothing more visceral than the sound of those apartment-sized chunks of ice breaking off the front of the glacier and crashing into the ocean beneath. However, there was something missing, something fundamentally missing, and that was the people. I still struggled to understand how this remote event affected me and others living around the world. Perhaps selfishly, I wanted to understand the human story. And so I became fascinated with the idea of documenting the impact climate change is having, not just on our planet, but on people living on these front lines all around the world. So two years, two years later, I had the chance to travel to Somaliland to photograph the effects of drought in a small and remote village called Budali. Now, Somaliland is a, a self-declared state in the northernmost part of Somalia, and this part of the world has always battled a regular drought. However, in recent years, it's become increasingly unrelenting and severe. Uh, an article, a 2014 article in The Guardian said that Somaliland could be considered the canary in the mine, so the, the warning system for a world that is getting hotter and where extreme weather is becoming more common. So while I was there, I stayed in a city called Burao, and every morning we would travel two and a half hours down an incredibly bumpy track to reach the village of Budli. And on our first drive, I was shocked to see the track lined with skeleton of goats and cattle <coughs> and camel, not just one-off individual cases, but at times, whole herds that had perished on the side of the road. These were the first victims of climate change in this part of the world. The secondary victims, however, were the people who live here. Budele is a village of nomadic pastoralists. They travel huge distances and rely on livestock for their livelihood. And without livestock, they had no livelihood, and without that, no money to buy food and little water to drink. I met one young man called Ahmed Hussein, who told me that he had travelled 48 hours by truck with 800 livestock to reach this man-made well. And along the way, he said that hundreds of his livestock had died and the rest were in critical condition. He was just doing his best to survive. We spent a lot of time in the village talking to the elders through our translator, Abdi, and I wanted to create pictures of people I met, but doing so against the backdrop of their village almost seemed to excuse the conditions we're so used to seeing this type of crisis photography, and it's easy to think, well, it's not what my back garden looks like, so how does that impact me? And so I wanted to try something different. I wanted to remove the individuals from their background to make the point that they are like you or me, but suffering at the hands of a very universal issue. So we used a black cloth and a small flash to make these portraits. These are some of the men and women who are living on the front lines of climate change today. The canaries in the mine facing a life or death challenge that is pushing an already difficult existence to the very edge. Every morning when this, these barrage of emails would come into my inbox, another place kept coming up, the country of Kiribati. Kiribati is a group of 33 atolls in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and it's one of the most remote countries in the world. Significantly also, it's one of the lowest lying at just two meters above sea level. Simply put, when the sea levels rise, Kiribati will be the first to go. I'd read about this country because of their energetic and charismatic president, Anote Tong, who became globally recognized during his 10-year presidency by campaigning ferociously for action on climate change. He made headlines when he purchased a plot of land in Fiji and introduced the Migration with Dignity Scheme, which essentially offered his population the chance to mass migrate from, Fiji to, from Kiribati to Fiji before they were forced to by rising sea levels. So inspired by an article I'd read by journalist uh, Kieran Pender, I had a chance to travel to Kiribati to make a short film about, about an amazing man called David Katursau. So David is a weightlifter from the island of Kiribati, and in 2014, he won gold at the Commonwealth Games here in Glasgow. 
Now, this was the first medal that Kiribati had ever won, let alone gold, and so naturally, David was overjoyed. And to celebrate, he did this eccentric dance, and it went viral. And when David was asked by journalists why he did the dance, he said that he was dancing to raise awareness for the plight of his island that would soon be overcome by rising sea levels. He said, every day my people fear for their lives as their homes are lost to the rising sea level. I beg the countries of the world to see what is happening to in Kiribati. The simple truth is that we do not have the resources to save ourselves. We will be the first to go. So in a way, David became this accidental environmental activist. And so I had a chance to spend some time with David and his family on the island. And I was fascinated by the I Kiribati way of life, by their intimate relationship with the water and with nature. But I was struck by this terrible irony that whilst the water was the very thing providing life in this part of the world, it may also be the very thing that deprives them of their homes. And so I was hoping to show you a short bit of the film I made, but it seems like that might be too complicated. So maybe we'll... <laughs> there you go. I'll just keep doing the dance and I'll keep you in. Um, anyway, we'll, maybe we'll try and show that later. That gives you an idea of what climate change is like in Kiribati. The point is that when we read news about climate change, uh, the human story is often missed out. Going to Kiribati made me realize that David and the people on this island, they're the humans behind those statistics. And they're the people who are being affected by what I saw all those years before on the glacier in Greenland. And behind David's jubilant dance is uh, a warning to us all. It feels like an understatement to say that these three trips have been eye-opening. Above all, they've taught me that climate change isn't just a planetary issue or an environmental issue, but a human one. And when you start to engage with the ecological crisis at hand, it can feel overwhelming and depressing. It's easier not to think about it, to just look away. Or it's easier to think, well, these seem like serious issues. Surely someone's got a plan, but they don't have a plan. They're too worried squabbling about Brexit. And so we have a grand challenge on our hands. We here are the first generation to really understand the impact that we're causing to our environment. But we're also being told that we're the last who can do anything about it. So it's up to us. It's up to us to change our mindsets, to change the way that we look at the environment, to be proud custodians of the planet. And in a way, we already think differently in many ways. We're the generation who's grown up with this narrative, and so we've begun to ask questions like, where do my clothes come from? Who or what was impacted in the process? Or where does the energy come from that's fueling this car, train, or plane? Or if I take this plastic bag or cup, where will it end up? Or better yet, where does my food come from? What was the process of that piece of beef getting to my plate? And when we start to ask these questions and lift the thick veil that protects us from seeing the processes involved, a new and shocking narrative is revealed. We know, for example, that besides causing untold suffering to billions of sentient beings, the agriculture industry is one of the chief causes of climate change. 1.3 billion cows take up 23% of the land mass on Earth, and the methane they produce is a major contributor to global warming. And furthermore, the process of rearing these cows is one of the foremost polluters of air, land, and water. We know this. We simply can't afford to continue eating meat and dairy in the way that we are. And the great thing about this issue is it's really easy to make change. We make the decision to eat three times every day, and we can simply choose not to eat animal products. It's the single biggest thing you can do to cut down your carbon emissions. When it comes to burning fossil fuels, we know that we can't continue, and again, we have solutions. We have the technology for wind, solar, and geothermal. It's possible that within the next 25 years, we're all going to create our own green energy and then share it on a central grid for free like we do with information on the internet. Transport, third biggest greenhouse gas emitter. Again, many of our generation aren't going to own a car. And if we do, we'll use car sharing, and they'll be self-driving, and importantly, they'll be electric. We have many of the answers but we're not moving fast enough, and you have to ask the question, why? And in my mind, it comes down to power. And not the renewable type of power, but the power of people who have vested interests in these polluting industries. We have to hold our politicians accountable. We need a radical political leadership who will genuinely consider our future, who will put planet over profit because that's what's at stake. We need a government that are going to tax carbon emissions, prohibit single-use plastics, cut subsidies to polluting industries, stop fracking in Lancashire. And don't get me wrong, climate change is a global issue, and so it's going to require global solutions. 
But this stands in stark contrast today to a world that is moving towards nationalism and isolationism. Climate change doesn't care about borders. It doesn't care about Donald Trump. It doesn't care about bloody Brexit. The fact is climate change is gonna affect us all, even though that right now the terrible irony is that climate change is affecting those who've done the least to cause it, like the people of Kiribati or the people of Somaliland. We need to be aware of not just ourselves or our friends or our neighbors or our country, but our biosphere as a whole, because if these three trips have taught me one thing, it's that everything is connected, from the glaciers in Greenland to the sea level in Kiribati. There is nothing like a common enemy to unite people. And in my mind, there's no enemy more common. We are the next generation. It's up to us to take up the fight. It's up to us to hear David's plea and then do something about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>